welcome to week five. This week, we're going to be focusing on language development among dual language learners. So our agenda for this session is we're going to start by reviewing the family visit assignment, which you have due on week eight, just to get you thinking about this assignment and giving you some time to ask questions if you're not that clear on what you're asked to do. Then we're going to look at dual language learners language development. We're going to talk about translanguaging and what does that mean. We're going to look at second language acquisition and how that might happen for our students. And then we're going to focus on some of the things that you can do as teachers in the classroom. And lastly, we're going to highlight the homework for this week as we do every week. So the family visits. We have a template on Blackboard that gives you the kinds of questions that you would ask the family in your visit, but that also asks you to do a pre-visit reflection. Then it highlights the questions for the interview, and then it asks you to do a post-visit reflection. So there's three main components to this assignment. One in which you reflect before you do the actual interview or the visit with the family. A second one in which you present, okay, these were the questions, you narrate what the experience was like, and you narrate the questions and the answers that you obtained from the families. And then lastly, you have a reflection of how the whole process, how the whole um, the family visit and the interview went for you. you. At this point, you can also touch upon the uh, pre reflection and see if some of those concerns or some of those um, worries that you had before conducting the family visit, if they vanished or if they actually proved to be important to be thinking about beforehand. With this assignment, we're going to use something that's called Heart Math. And this uh, book by Georgia Hurd is called Heart Maps is a technique or presents a technique for us. Um, the book has many different heart maps that are all used with this template with a heart outlined in it. And these are the images that you see here are just examples of some heart maps. And what you're gonna do is use this heart map, the, the blank template as a starting point to get the families to talk about the child. So the family visit, you the purpose for it is for you to get to know the family of your focal child a little bit better, but also to obtain information from them about your focal child that then you can use in your language portfolio that you're developing on this uh, on your focal child. So one of the things that this heart map is going to allow you to do is to have something concrete in front of the family that they can sort of use to um, prompt conversations about the child. And one of the things I recommend my students to do is to create a heart map yourself and bring it to the interview in the family visit with the, with the family of, of your focal child and show it to them so that they know sort of what you're expecting or what a heart map looks like. And again, these are some examples of what heart maps uh, look like, and they all have different uh, themes to them. But what you want from the family is for them to draw a heart map of all of the things that they love about their child. So all of their strengths, their interests, the things that make their child unique. So that's what the heart map is going to be for the family. For you, you can do a heart map of all the things that make you, you. And then you can bring this as an example to give to the parents or the family that you're, the family members that you're meeting with as an example of what theirs could potentially look like. Again, you don't necessarily have to have the most advanced artistic skills. It doesn't necessarily have to look like the ones that we have here in the example. Yours might look very different than the ones that are presented here, and yours might look very different from what the family comes up with. But you can show this to them in advance um, or as an example of, of what they could do. So before the visit is to take place, 
make sure you send the blank template of the heart map to the family um, and tell them that you're, we're going to be using this during the interview, during the, the visit, so that they have it handy and some, and they can bring in crayons or markers or pens or whatever writing instrument they want to use to create their heart map. Okay, so let me know if you have any questions about the family visit and please start thinking about how you're going to conduct it. Please start getting in touch with the, your focal child's family to see when would be a best date to meet. Start looking at the template, start looking at the heart map template and design, uh, start like designing in your mind what this family visit will look like. And you can start already thinking about that pre-visit reflection. What are some things that are coming up for you? Some concerns, some worries, some questions that you have, and start selecting the questions that you're going to be asking the family about your focal child. Okay, so we're gonna start uh, focusing on dual language learners and their language development. So dual language learners are gonna be learners that we have in our classrooms that either speak two languages or are learning to speak another language aside their original native language. And dual language learners is a terminology that is used in the literature and it's abbreviated as DLL for short. Um, but it also, um, these, these students have also been called second language learners, so SLL or English language learners, ELL, or dual language learners, DLL, and they've also been called emergent bilinguals. And actually, emergent bilinguals, or EB, is the term that is most sort of accurate in the field currently. That's not to say it might change in the future, but right now, emergent bilinguals is what uh, most uh, scholars and researchers that are working in this area are going to be terming these kinds of, of learners. Okay, so some things to take into consideration. Children should be focused on communication and not necessarily learning gram grammatical rules of the language that they're learning, either their home language or their uh, target language or new language. So they should be learning the second language or the target language in a natural way, in the same way that they learned their home language or native language, right? So it means that language is used, it has a purpose for communication with others. And that's how they should be learning the grammatical rules, by listening to others communicate and replicating what they hear in when they're trying to communicate with others as well. I put here uh, in this slide L1 equals home language and L2 equals new language. Home language sometimes is referred as first language or native language. And they're all going to be identified with this nomenclature of L1. So it means language one, meaning the first language that the child learned or acquired. L2 is the second language that the child learns or acquired and is sometimes it's called the new language but sometimes it's called the second language or sometimes it's called the target language meaning that the language that is spoken in the school and the community and sort of in the larger uh, context in which the child is embedded is the target language or the language that the child needs to learn versus the native first or home language, which is the child, the language that the child already knows. So again, this L1 and L2 is going to be used for sort of all of these definitions. L1 for home language, first language, native language, and L2 is going to be used for new language, second language, or target language. So they're all, they're all going to fall under these categories. And I'm explaining this because when you read the literature and the research, some scholars and researchers use L1 to represent one of these um, ways of identifying that first language. And some scholars are going to use um, the same nomenclature to 
denote uh, and they call it home language or they call it native language instead of first language. But that's all of them are going to be identified with L1 and then the target language, all of them are going to be identified with L2. Okay, so another thing that is important to identify or to provide students with is time. So you teach the rules of language and form of language in context and provide time for children to really uh, feel safe enough or uh, courageous enough to use the, the now the, the new language and the structure and the, and the rules that they're um, trying to ascertain of the new language. So they need experience and they need practice. And it all needs to be taught or uh, facilitated, mediated as a way of communication, as a means for communication. So, so keep that in mind when you're trying to help children that whose native language is not English and whose target language is English to learn that target language. Keep that in mind in terms of what the language is used for. So children learn languages in a predictable way. We saw this when we, when we um, <clears throat> read Crashin in week two. There's a sequence in which children learn and develop language skills. And that is going to be true for their native language and it's going to be true for their target language as well. So another thing to be mindful of, mindful of is that children should be taught at one level above what they currently are comfortable with or what they currently know. So L plus one. And this is similar to Krashen's comprehensible input plus one, right? So that the input that you that you provide for the children needs to be one level above what they currently know and feel comfortable with. If it's too advanced, you're doing a disservice to the child because they're not going to be able to comprehend if it's, it's if it's way beyond their comfortable level. And if it's below, you're not helping them continue to progress or or advance in their language acquisition. Okay, and lastly, how you feel about how you are learning the language is going to affect how you actually learn the language. So it's going to be very important to create an environment in which the child feels safe and secure and that is not being put in the spotlight or, or humiliated or ridiculized in front of his or her peers because then that's going to affect negatively the continuing uh, development of the target language. So remember what Krashen said about the effective filter, that's going to, add that those emotions can act as a filter impeding the child to continue to develop their, and progress in their, in their language development. Okay, so let's move into translanguaging and let's look at what translanguaging is, sort of where it comes from and um, how is it worked with in educational settings? So translanguaging is a culturally sustaining practice. So when we're talking about culturally sustaining pedagogies and practices that we implement in a classroom, a culturally sustaining one is going to help us, as the word says, sustain the different cultural backgrounds that we have in our classroom and language by being part of of someone's cultural background is going to be part of that culturally sustaining approach. So culturally sustaining pedagogies focus on sustaining and extending the richness of our pluralistic society. All of the languages, literacies, and cultural ways of being that our students and communi communities embody, both marginalized and dominant. So all of our are um, the richness of all of our cultural background is going to be supported under a culturally sustaining pedagogical approach. So explicitly, these pedagogies sustain linguistic, literate, and cultural pluralisms through forefronting multilingual heritage language family and community practices in classroom spaces and beyond. 
So it's not just what happens in the classroom, but what happens in the school as a whole reflects what the community and the families that live in these communities are um, bringing to as as richness. It's it's seen from a, a valuable lens what they're bringing into the school as richness in terms of their linguistic background, their literacy, and their cultural pluralism as a whole. So translanguaging is going to embrace these culturally sustaining types of pedagogies or approaches. And what exactly is it? So the complex dynamic and flexible ways in which bilingual individuals mesh languages and codes employing a rich repertoire of fluid linguistic turns when speaking along a continua of biliteracy is, is one of the definitions of translanguaging. So it's a way of acknowledging that what children bring with them into the classroom in terms of funds of knowledge, funds of linguistic knowledge is an asset. And it's a very complex and rich repertoire of skills that they bring. So Ophelia Garcia is one of the uh, first scholars who came up with this translanguaging term. So she talks about a linguistic repertoire that the children bring, the children that speak a native language other than, in our case, English, that is different than the named languages. So she talks about named languages, which are the languages when we when we talk about languages, when we say, okay, Spanish is a language and Portuguese is a language and English is a language and Italian is a language and so on. Those are named languages. And that the child, you might identify them as knowing one of these languages, as these languages being one of their native languages. But the repertoire, the linguistic repertoire that they bring is going to be different than just that word because it's going to be tinted by their cultural background. So the linguistic repertoire is going to be a little beyond of just what we think about when we think of a person that knows how to speak X native language or X named language as Ophelia Garcia uh, refers to them. Translanguaging is different from previous thinking about bilingualism as a bilingual language repertoire is not made up of two distinct separate languages, right? So what they're talking about here is that it's not necessarily, oh, I know how to speak Spanish and I know how to speak English and I have these two separate entities of language in my brain and then I can separate these two and pull from one when I'm speaking that language and pull from the other when I'm speaking that other language. But it's more so that all of those skills are meshed together in one same container, if you want to view it that way, in which all of those skills and all of that knowledge base is, is there. And when you're going to communicate, regardless of the language that you're communicating in, you're pulling from that full linguistic repertoire in order to communicate. And because you're doing that, it's not the same as code switching, where you would go from one language to the other. It's you're pulling from your entire pool of skills that you have in your linguistic toolbox to be able to convey meaning and communicate with another person, regardless of the language that you're doing it in. So it's, it's different in, fundamentally, it's different than what code switching entails. Okay, so there are three videos that explain a little more in depth what translanguaging is. And I want you guys to pause this video and go look at those videos. So the first one is this video on translanguaging and it has a bit of an explanation. The first time I heard a description of translanguaging, I was like, what? 
of what translanguaging is, right? So you can watch this video, then you can watch this other video on translanguaging explained by Ophelia Garcia. So this was a lecture that she um, gave in which she explains what translanguaging is. So what is translanguaging, right? Translanguaging is using language. Okay, so you can watch this video as well, and then you can watch this third video which is also Ophelia Garcia. Hi, my name is Ophelia Garcia. I'm a professor of urban education here at the Graduate Center. And today I've been asked... And this one, she explains a little bit more about the difference between translanguaging and code switching. So this was another good one for you to see. So pause this video, go watch those videos, or maybe finish this lecture and then afterwards go watch the videos. And the discussion board activity that we have for this week is based on translanguaging and what you've learned through um, the explanation that I just gave you and the videos that you're going to be watching. Okay, so let's move to oral development among emergent bilingual. So remember I told you that emergent bilingual was one of the terms that we used to talk about children that spoke different languages. And this emergent bilingual comes from the translanguaging uh, field. So the types of second language acquisitions, there's different ways in which children can acquire a second language. So there's a sequential acquisition and there's a simultaneous acquisition. In the sequential acquisition, the child acquires one language first and then learns and acquires the second one. For example, when I learned English, I learned in a sequential way. I had lived in Venezuela and had only heard and learned Spanish because I was surrounded by Spanish-speaking people and I was in a Spanish-speaking preschool and I was everything in, in that uh, the country that I was coming from was in Spanish. And when I moved to the U.S., I was enrolled in an English uh, pre-K class and had to quickly learn English. So, but I already had my foundation of the Spanish language um, acquired and solidified to the extent that a four-year-old has it, right? So, I learned Spanish first, and then I learned and acquired English in a sequential fashion. Simultaneous acquisition is when you're learning both languages at the same time. For example, my niece, who was born in New York, had Spanish input from her family, but had English input from the community, the TV, the friends, the schools, everything around her, right? So, in this case, she was learning Spanish as she was learning English at the same time. This can also happen with uh, households where one parent speaks one language and the other speaks another language as a native language to the child, and the child is in that household maybe learning French from the mom and Italian from the dad. And they might be living in the U.S., so the child might eventually learn English by going into an English setting or speaking to neighbors or playing with other children or listening to the TV that it's in English. But the two parents are speaking to the child in two different languages and she is then simultaneously acquiring both. And when she acquires English, so she'll be trilingual and not bilingual, right? But, but it's a simultaneous acquisition of these languages. So this is important to note. When you're working with a child that is a newcomer that has just come into your classroom, that's just moved to the US from a different country where the child in that country spoke a different language other than English, that child is going to go through a sequential acquisition. Knowing their first language and bringing a linguistic repertoire that is rich in the first language and then you helping them acquire that English as a second language, right? Uh, the simultaneous, again, is going to occur when it's happening at the same time. The children are learning both languages at the same time. Another thing to think about or to have present when we're working with emergent bilinguals is that there are some fluid phases of second language acquisition, right? So, and this is fluid because 
Some children jump through phases. Some children go through phases at a rapid pace. Then other children might get sort of stuck in one stage for a longer period of time and so on. So depending on the child, these phases are going to look a little bit differently if you compare one child to the other. So the first phase, and again, fluid phase, is that the child is going to be using the home language, the language that they know. So again, thinking about that newcomer that has just come into your classroom that just moved to the U.S. recently and is new to English in, in, in every way, that child might be speaking to you and to the other children in their native language because that's a language they know. And that's the language in which they have communicated with other people in the past. And they know that the skills that they have to communicate have served them well in the past to be able to communicate with the people that they, they, they wanted to communicate with. So they're going, the first phase is when the child comes in, in say an English classroom, English speaking classroom, and the child speaks in, say the child is coming from Guatemala, and in Guatemala they speak Spanish, and the child is coming in and, and speaking only Spanish. And will speak Spanish to you, not really comprehending why you don't understand, right? Because that's, that before that has worked. The nonverbal period occurs when the child begins to understand that the language that they speak is not the language that others speak and starts to identify, oh, there's two languages here and I don't know how to speak in the other language. So there's this nonverbal period or silent period where the child might be communicating with you and with other children in a nonverbal way, using body language, using hand gestures or facial gestures to be able to convey um, meaning, but will not use verbal speech. So, and, and again, some of some authors call this the silent period where the child is really not speaking at all, not using their native language, not using the target language because they don't know it yet. And it's just in this period where they communicate through sign language. Um, but uh, that doesn't mean that the child is not learning at, at this point, is not acquiring language at this point, just because they're not speaking it. Formulaic or telegraphic speech is going to be this third uh, fluid phase of second language acquisition where the child begins to use the new language in sort of chunks or phrases, repeats phrases that they that they learned, like please and thank you and want water or, or need bathroom or just phrases that they've heard others use and they can repeat them. It's not necessarily a fully formed sentence, but they're words that are easily recognizable by the target language speaker with whom he's or she's trying to communicate. The last language is productive language use. And this is when the child is able to build their own sentences and phrases and be able to orally communicate fluidly with another and the other person um, can easily understand what they're trying to say. So again, children will go through these phases, some of them quicker than others. Some of these phases will last more uh, time than others. But it's going to depend on the child, on the age of the child, on the personality of the child, the effective filter <clears throat> of the child, and um, the, the environment, the context in which the child is in. Okay, so lastly, what can teachers do? If we know all these things about uh, emergent bilinguals and dual language learners. What can we do? Well, we can label our room in many languages especially privileging or highlighting the home languages that the, the, of the children over English, over the target language. So highlighting those languages so that the child feels accepted and valued. And that effective filter can be lowered. Two, teach one level above their knowledge of the target language of L2. So you, if you're, teach, you're teaching in English, you're going to gauge where the child is in their language acquisition and teach one level above 
that level in which they're in. And you're using the zone of proximal development because you're mediating for the child, going from, say, they're in level A to level B with your help. So you're mediating for them to uh, move to the next level. Use sentence frames. So give ch the children uh, frames of sentences so they can fill in the blanks. Uh, for example, I like blank with blank. So I, I might say something like, I like playing with Joe, right? So you just have to fill in the blanks with a verb or a noun, but you don't have to formulate the entire sentence. That's going to help children be able to communicate uh, more fluidly um, and, quicker, and quicker than if you just ask them to come up with a full sentence by themselves. Use games, use centers in your classroom, use books, um, talk a lot, use a lot of verbal and oral language in your classroom in order to foster receptive and expressive vocabulary in your emergent bilinguals. Use a word wall and an alphabet wall, but remember that they need to be culturally sustaining. So be careful about the images that you put in your classroom and the messages that these images convey. Then questions, questions, ask questions, have the children ask questions, have the emergent bilinguals ask questions. Questions are gonna promote thinking and thinking is gonna promote curiosity and that curiosity is gonna help them with that receptive and expressive vocabulary. Encourage translanguaging. So not to say uh, you're gonna uh, translate. So mind that difference. Trans Languaging is not the same as translating. You're not going to translate everything that you, that you say, but you're going to allow the children to use their native language in order to solve a problem, in order to come up with a response to a homework or a task that they're working on, in order to think through an activity that you've asked them to do. So don't say things like only English in this classroom. Help them improve their English by pulling from their full linguistic repertoire that they have probably filled majorly with their native language than with um, what they have of English, right? So let them use those tools and feel empowered. Make sure your library contains window and mirror language text in both languages or in all the languages that you have in your classroom because sometimes even if you're an English mainstream classroom, you're going to have children that speak many different native languages. So try to target or try to include all of the languages that you have in your classroom. View families as resources. So interview families and have kids interview their families and bring in a sort of their cultural background to share with the class. Do activities like name stories where you look at the, where the name, where their name came from. Um, you can do activities or units around the history of us as, as each child individually or the history of us as a community. Um, then family visits with something that we're going to do in this class as an assignment are also really good to get to know the children that you um, are working with and their families and using the families as resources to get this information. So set up a room that fosters talk and play by having meeting spaces where you all come together as a community, by having centers or workstations or work time, but also include what, um, what Jessica Martell calls in her classroom, Nuestro Tiempo, and, and free play. Uh, activities in which, or times within the school day in which children can really freely play and interact with each other. Multicultural and multilingual curriculum and materials that are centered in students' funds of knowledge and their particular interests. You can be an advocate for your students and make sure that you, if your school doesn't uh, provide sufficient materials or support for these students, make sure that you're advocating for them to get them those materials and those supports. And then if you can, assess the children in their home language so that you can truly know what they know and not what they don't know 
just because it's being assessed in English. Okay, these are some examples of some uh, labeling that you can do in the classroom by teachers or even by students. Students can create their own language, uh, their own labels. Then name stories based on books and units that you can do around books that can help you get to know your students better and make them feel like they're valued and accepted in your classroom. Okay, so for this week, the homework is you have admin slip three to submit, and that's Pina et al. and Allen. Those are two articles that are on Blackboard uh, for your admin slip three. Then your second observation of your focal child is also due this week. And then the speech pathologist interview assignment is also due this week, and all of them are due um, on Blackboard. The discussion board that we're going to do as an activity for this week is going to be reflecting on translanguaging. And after you watch the, um, the videos, we're going to I'm going to ask you to think about translanguaging and how would you facilitate it in your classroom? How would you make sure that this is happening in your classroom? That's all for now. I will talk to you again next week.